Well, good morning again. I'm Gene, part of the team here at Restore, and uh, what a privilege it is to speak to you this morning from um, the Word of God and what I believe He's put on my heart for this first Sunday of the new year. I always feel like I'm learning no matter what I'm doing. I'm trying to learn new things. I'm trying to uh, stay uh, connected with um, people younger than me so that I don't get old and stale, you know? So I try to, try to uh, surround myself with people that have fresh ideas. Um, I don't always expect to learn new words, though, or new phrases, but this week, oh, by the way, our fifth anniversary is next weekend. Did you remember that? Yeah, and so it's pretty exciting. We're, we're going to go to the Goshen Theater. You'll hear more about this, uh, but we're, we're gonna go back to where it all started, the Goshen Theater next Sunday afternoon, and we're going to watch uh, Nemo together. But this week, and we're not taking a poll, so keep your vote to yourself, but um, this week there was a text thread among a few of us that um, uh, allowed us to vote on Finding Nemo or the, emperor, the Emperor's New Groove. Anyway, Nemo won out. But in the process, one of the guys said, well, Nemo's okay, but I feel like the Emperor's New Groove is so slept on. Slept on? I was in my office, he was out front, I said, hey, Chris, what does slept on mean? What is that? And so I found out. Apparently, the emperor's new groove is underrated, overlooked, and ignored. Also, that was the phrase number one. The second phrase in this new year that I heard for the very first time was riz. R-I-Z-Z, riz. Apparently, that means dude's got charisma. Dude's got riz. We all, we all keep learning, whether inadvertently or on purpose. This morning, I want to talk to you about next up. Next up. We're in a new year, it's 2023, it's a prime time for reflection on of the trajectory of our lives. Where have we been and where in the world are we going? I, I chose next up because when, you, uh, when you're at the ballpark and you have a baseball player that's coming up to bat, usually the, the announcer says something like, and next up to bat, or in, uh, in the soccer world, you know, there's a penalty kick. And the announcer says, because we're all focused on that penalty kick, the announcer says something like, next up for this penalty kick is so-and-so. So next up, if you're next up, are you ready? If you're next up to bat, if you're next up to take that penalty kick, if you're next up in whatever it is that you're leaning into this year, are you ready? Are you ready? Because many of you uh, maybe have not uh, been here very long, maybe you're brand new this morning, I wanted to just kind of reintroduce myself. And maybe you've never heard some of my story. But I started learning, as all of us do, in my home with my parents. They started downloading to me what is good, right, and appropriate. Then they, and when I was 13 years old, I got my very first job and they hoped for the best as I stepped out into a place where they weren't gonna be present, right? I became a busboy. That was my very first job, clearing tables at a restaurant. How many of you have ever been in the restaurant business, like worked in the restaurant business? Yeah, so there's a lot of company here. So you know what I'm talking about. Well, that was my first job and the hospitality and restaurant industry got into my blood. I mean, really deep into my blood. I loved it. At about the same time, I was a farm hand. So I was helping a local farmer on the farm and I was learning how to drive a tractor and what to do with uh, you know, cattle, that sort of thing. 
I have been a factory worker. I've been in construction. I have done, I've been in sales and in purchasing. Um, I did a stint at uh, Rosedale Bible, Bible College as a student. I have, uh, then I stepped back into the hospitality and food service industry and owned and managed uh, restaurants. We've owned a cleaning business. Um, we have been part owners of a sea salt and seasoning company. I became the administrative pastor at Maple City Chapel here in town. And from there, I was at Granger Community Church as a campus pastor. And that is bringing us up to 2017. And this thing we call Restore Church. While at Restore, I have leaned into coaching and uh, in life and leadership. You know, I tell you all of that because sometimes we need framework for where people come from. Sometimes we need a framework for ourselves to remember, oh, I started there. How did I get to here? What happened in the intervening years? Because I, I gave you the high points. Uh, trust me, some of those were low points, but I, I gave you the, 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 the macro level, right? Then we have these big things that happen that literally change the trajectory of most of our lives. Like when we get married, that's a big, big deal. And when you have babies, that's a really big deal. A lot of you are finding out about that right now. Babies, they're awesome, but they change your life. 21 years ago, I was in a head-on car collision. I got airlifted to Fort Wayne, to Parkview Medical Center. Nearly lost my life. That changed the trajectory of my life. I was following Jesus, but something changes when you nearly lose your life. In 2021, I was diagnosed with cancer. That's a really big deal. You never expect to hear the C word, but when you hear it, it changes the trajectory of your life at some level. What has been life-changing in your life? What are the things that you can look at and say, when that happened, nothing was ever the same. When that happened, I changed course. See, a lot of us, a lot of you uh, that are in high school, middle school, college age, a lot of us are thinking in terms of, what is God's will for my life? As I look back at where I've been and where I'm going, what's, what's his will for my life? Some of us are broaching 60 years of age and we're saying, gee, I wonder what God's will is for my life. What is God's will for my life? What will I become? Where will I live? For some of us, where will I retire? If we're not married, we're surely asking the question, am I getting married? Who am I going to marry? Are we gonna have kids and are they gonna be ugly? Like, we ask those questions. Some of us have real fear about some of those things. So let me give you, let me give you some insight, some guiding principles that I have established for myself and maybe they'll be helpful for you. So three things, prepare, position, and produce. Prepare, position, produce. If you're taking notes this morning, write those down. Those will be helpful. Prepare. That's what we're doing right now. Some of you are at a collegiate or high school level and you're preparing. It's not just all about head knowledge in your preparation. Remember, this is also about What's happening inside of you? What's happening in your heart, your emotions? You're preparing yourself. I'm still preparing because I'm not done yet. So what's, what am I preparing for? 
keeping my options open, thinking clearly, having clarity about where I've been and hopefully where I'm going. Uh, there's a simple rule for me that says when you're prepared, you spend less time thinking about yourself. When you're prepared, you spend less time thinking of yourself because I know you as a human being, because I know me as a human being, and I spend most of my time thinking about myself. Let's just be clear. You and I spend most of our time thinking about ourselves. When I get up here to talk to you guys, if I'm prepared, I don't spend as much time thinking about how stupid I'm gonna look in about five minutes. I don't worry so much about Am I gonna make a fool of myself? Am I gonna say things correctly? Am I going to say things in the way that is best understood? When I'm prepared, I don't think about myself so much. So there are some daily preparation uh, processes that um, we don't have time to cover them all, but let me just point us to habits. Habits. When we've been formed by a habit, it's something that we do unconsciously. So if we've been formed by a habit and we do it unconsciously, then it would stand to reason that it has a, has a fundamental impact on our hearts. Like it, it reshapes our hearts. And guess what? Just because it's a habit and just because it has, it has a big impact, it, it orders our day, our habits seem to order our days. Our habits, we may say we believe one thing, but really our habits say what we really believe. Our habits tell us and those around us what it is exactly that we do believe. Even though we say all kinds of nice things, even though we say we do certain things, if you take stock of what you actually do, you follow your habits and you do what you really believe. So to fully understand habits is to think of them as liturgies. If you're not familiar with a liturgy, that's a pattern of words or actions repeated regularly as a way of worship in order to be formed in a certain way. For example, when I was growing up as a child, my family never went to bed without uh, praying together. That was just a, that was just a, a, a thing that we did. It was a well, we would have felt very odd not doing that. that. That would have been out of the ordinary. That was a habit. It was a habit that was formed. It was an assumption that was made in our family that before we go to bed, we're all going to kneel in the living room and we're going to pray together. So that's how I grew up. And always that prayer ended with the Lord's Prayer. Now I learned something new about the Lord's Prayer this year. My friend Julie, who I've talked about before, she trips me up sometimes, but I love her. And she grew up Catholic. And she said, um, well, when I was growing up in Catholic school, I would have to say a certain number of our fathers. And I said, our fathers? Yeah, when you do penance, like the priest tells you how many our fathers. Oh, the Lord's Prayer. Okay, okay. Our fathers, I had never heard that phrase. It was always the Lord's Prayer. But I think the Catholics are onto something because when we say our father, everything flows from that. And it helps us remember who we're talking to. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Our father, it reminds us who we're talking to. So this was then a principle in my life of remembering the Lord's Prayer. And I can tell you the Lord's Prayer, I can recite that to you in German, or I can recite it to you in English. I first learned it in German. I'll tell you, years ago when we did a study of the Lord's Prayer, I began to take that apart each phrase apart. And then I began to pray it for the, for the first time in decades. I began to pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father in German. The meaning and the beauty of praying something in a certain way that 
has not been part of my life for a long time. And now switching it and being able to pray in both languages has been powerful and a beautiful thing for me. Uh, Justin Early, in his book, The Common Rule, says this. He says, habits as liturgies may seem odd, but we need language to emphasize, listen, emphasize the non-neutrality of our day-to-day routines. Our day-to-day routines are not neutral. Our habits often obscure what we're really worshiping. Our habits often obscure what we're really worshiping. But that doesn't mean we're not worshiping something. The question is simply, what are we worshiping? What are you worshiping as you go about your day-to-day work? The more prepared you are, the less time you'll spend thinking of yourself. The more prepared you are, the more time you'll be focused on true worship, which is God our Father. So a couple things that I do, a couple habits I have, sort of unintentional, But all of a sudden, I found myself, Psalm 5110. This is one of the habits I have daily, is it during my prayer time. It is not just about praying about, I want this, I want that, or please take care of this, heal that, restore that. But it is creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Those words have have brought life to me. That request Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. In Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, the words, search me, O God, and renew and and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is anything wicked in me. This is, this is a, it, it is a bit of a mantra, but it is scripture. It is the word of God. It's the writing of, of David saying, oh God, I have fallen short. It realigns me either in the morning or at the close of day or in the middle of the day, depending on what I'm getting into. Search me, oh God. See if there's anything wicked in me. These have been life-giving, beautiful words for me. Here's the issue. The church The church is often not very patient with the process of preparation. This process of preparation, it takes time. But instead of giving time, we often say, well, let me teach you how to live differently. Let me teach you how to live differently instead of let me show you how to live differently. Because you know what? Teaching takes a lot less time than showing. Teaching is is education. It's what we learn. It's what we know. Formation, spiritual formation is what we practice. It is what we do. Let me say that again. Education is what we learn and know. Things we're taught. Formation is what we practice and do. Things that are caught. You've all heard it. More is caught than taught. If I show you how to walk, if I tell you how to walk, Those are two very distinctly different things. Especially if I tell you how to walk and then I walk the other way and I don't even do what I said that you should do. This consistent life of living in alignment with Jesus, this preparation process will allow us to then position ourselves. Prepare and position. By position, I don't mean jockey your way into a position. Push others aside so that you can flourish. You know what I mean by position is to be, uh, to be curious. Look, nothing we learn is ever wasted. There's always a, something to um, receive in our learning, even if it feels terrible. There is something to learn. Nothing is ever wasted. I believe that with all my heart. Nothing is ever wasted. I spent, I spent a number of years uh, diving into illegal drugs and, well, not literally diving in, but, you know, using illegal drugs. Uh, you could say those were wasted years, and perhaps they were to some extent. But I'll tell you what, I learned a lot in those years. I learned about, a lot about myself. I learned a lot about other people. So I don't look at that as just a waste of my life. Nothing is ever wasted. Be curious. 
Keep asking questions. Be flexible. You're positioning yourself. If you're going to, if you're going to position yourself, if, you, if you're going to get ready for whatever's next, if you're next up, you'll want to position yourself in a way that is flexible. Be flexible. Sometimes you have to say no to something, but say more yeses than noes. Sometimes you say no because you want to say a better yes. Well, that's a good thing. You can't say yes to every single thing, but say more yeses than noes. And especially when there's an opportunity ahead of you for more learning, by all means, say yes. You bet. Let me jump in. Let me find out. Let me learn. Some of you have already heard me talk about my mentor that was sort of just became an organically came into my life. It wasn't an intentional mentorship. At least I didn't know it was. And I figure out that is probably the best kind of mentoring. If, if I come up to you and say, let me be your mentor, you're probably going to go get away from me. I don't even know you. But if I become your friend and then I begin to be influential in your life, you're likely going to listen, hear me, you may even invite me in to a mentorship. But what happened to me was it was just all organic. It just happened. This older guy took me under his wing and started inviting me into his sphere of influence and introduced me to people, took me to uh, educational experiences where uh, it was back in the day of, uh, oh, what was the guy's name? Brian Tracy, I think, was the guy's name. And um, the, my mentor had, like, uh, books of cassette. You guys know what cassette tapes are? Yeah, cassette tapes in them. And we would, that's all we would, we would just listen to these motivational, inspirational messages driving wherever we were driving. Like, cassette tapes everywhere. Here, Gene, here's the next one you got to listen to. Here's the next one you got to listen to. I'll tell you. That sort of mentorship, if you can position yourself to receive that, there, that's like money cannot buy that sort of mentorship, that sort of influence in our lives. He had a lot to do with positioning me for whatever's next. Positioning is incredibly important. Prepare, position. The final one is produce. So now you're prepared now you've positioned yourself, and now you're going to produce. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in John chapter 8 when he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world, he said. But then in Matthew chapter 5, he flips the script and he says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. All right? I learned this in the King James. So here is the third scripture that is part of my daily mantra, if you will. I learned it in the King James, and then I translated it after that to my version. My version simply says, let my light so shine before men that they might see my good works and glorify you, my Father in heaven. Let my light so shine before men, not that they would see how great I am, but that they would see how great you are. Let your light shine through me. Here's what I know. How I live today informs the life I live tomorrow. How I'm going to live today, how I'm going to prepare, how I'm going to position prepares me for how I'm going to produce. If my life is self-centered, if my life is spent in, with a critical spirit, then that informs how my life will be later. So ask questions before making statements. That's a good rule of life. Ask questions before making statements. 
Be generous with the benefit of the doubt. I don't know about you, but that one is awfully hard for me because I just assume that somebody meant it for bad instead of for good when they do something that ticks me off, right? So I've really had to train my mind to assume the best and not the worst, to assume that there's some intelligence in that head even though they haven't lived it out. I assume there's something there that's going to inform them. Lead with humility. Look, if you're in leadership, this is, this is, I can't overstate this. Lead with humility. Humble leadership does not mean weak leadership. Humble leadership is confident. It is disciplined. Often we think that confidence and humility are, um, are not mutually well, they can't live together, right? But they're not mutually exclusive. You can actually lead with humility and lead with confidence. That's what I hope we have a church full of people of. I hope that every one of you steps into your place of employment, every place where you have impact and influence, whether you're a student, whether you're an administrator, whatever it is you're doing. And retirees, don't sit back and don't do, don't, think you don't have impact because you do. You do. And so lead. Wherever you go, lead. Finally, let me talk to you about spiritual growth. Um, some of us think someday, someday, somehow I will grow spiritually. I'm going to become a better person. But right now I'm preparing and I'm positioning. I'll produce later. Let me tell you, if you don't produce spiritual growth throughout the journey, you're going to be hard pressed to get to where you think you want to go and then begin to produce spiritual growth in your life. Spiritual growth can be like, oh my gosh, what is that? Like, do I really have to do that? Well, I don't know. It's been pretty good in my life. I've learned a lot. Dallas Willard, towards the end of his life, was asked, so Dallas Willard, if you don't know who that is, I mean, he's a guy that has spent his um, entire life learning and teaching others how to pray, how to meditate on scripture, how to fast, seek silence, solitude, serve, give, and so on. This is who Dallas Willard is, was. He's passed on, but he's a, a prolific author, a, a great, great, uh, really an expert on spiritual growth. And about a year before his death, he was being interviewed and um, they ask him, if a person wants to grow spiritually, what would your advice be? Where would you start? Where would you tell them to start? And he thought for a minute. And he said, do the next right thing you know you ought to do. Well, that's not difficult, is it? Do the next right thing you know you ought to do. So, that's a simple Statement for spiritual growth. Do the next right thing you know you ought to do. The next person that comes in front of you, how do you treat them? How do you lean into them? How do you help them? What is God calling you to do or to stop doing right now? These are some questions you can ask when it comes to your spiritual growth. What's God asking me to do right now? What is he asking me to stop right now? What is he calling you to pick up or set down? Who is he leading you to meet with, to call or write to? What blessing? Is he inspiring you to give or do for someone else? What impression or instruction is on your heart or mind from the Lord? Some of this may not make sense to you. It may not even sound like a very spiritual task or an assignment, but you know in your heart that obedience looks, what obedience looks like. And it looks like doing this thing that God has impressed upon you. It's so much easier to say, no, 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 new year, old me. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. Well, let me say this morning, whatever that is, you ought to probably press in. Figure out what that is in your life and jump on in, get after it. When we give ourselves to preparation, to positioning, to producing, we're gonna be ready for whatever comes up next. We're into 2023. What are you waiting on? What if you're next up? Are you ready? Are you ready? 
Have you prepared? Have you positioned yourself? And are you ready to kick it when it comes to production? I've often said, I hope that anybody that calls Restore home is the best at what they do. That they work as unto the Lord. Like they work like nobody else. Like they influence like nobody else. They withhold gossip like no one else. They are the positive voice in their workplace. In fact, I always hope that every one of you, when you step into whatever it is that you do on a daily basis, that someone around you says, where are there more of you? Where will I find more of you? And your simple answer is, restore church. That's what I hope for. Because you know what? The transformation of your life is not dependent on whether you sit in these seats on a Sunday morning. The transformation of your life is how you live it out in the day-to-day -day practice in front of your peers and your people that you influence. That's where the rubber hits the road, my friends. That's where you're going to make the difference. If you're the person that speaks kind words and chooses not to swear at those that offend you, you've got a leg up. You're actually exuding strength and confidence in that moment. You're leading from a place that many people do not lead. Would you stand with me? I wanna finish my talk this morning by just encouraging you. From Psalm 37, here's my fourth, my fourth scripture that is often on my mind. This isn't one of my daily mantras, but delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I never really connected with that until 2008, actually not until 2019. It happened in 2008 when I was the administrative pastor at Maple City Chapel on the other side of town. And I would drive into town for meetings or whatever I was doing, and I would drive past the corner of 5th and Madison, right here. And I'd heard stories about what was happening out in the Pacific Northwest where it was mostly post-Christian, old um, traditional churches were dying, and they were, being, um, they were giving their buildings, and they were, they were um, uh, new expressions of faith were happening in these old traditional buildings. And I would drive by here, and I would say, and I would think, God, if I could just, if I could ever do church in that building, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? So that happened in 2008, 2009, and in 2019, I got a message on Facebook that said, hey, I work with this woman in my office, and she just told me that Faith Lutheran is going to vacate their building at Fifth and Madison and it's gonna be for sale. Well, all of a sudden, I'm remembering that there was a time in my life where I dreamed about doing church in this building. I can't explain that. Only thing I know, and in fact, I'd never prayed about it. Like, I never like, dear God, I really would love to do church in that building. It was a statement. See, God knows the desires of your heart. He doesn't just wait for you to spell it all out. Sometimes it's a fragment of a prayer. Sometimes it's simply, God, help. If the desire of your heart is such that it is in alignment with Jesus, Scripture indicates that he would give those desires to you. We're here at the corner of 5th and Madison. I don't know. I know where I've been and I have an idea of where I'm going. But sometimes I stand in front of you and go, I don't know how I got here. And then I remember again. I remember. 
we have to remember where we've come from to be informed about where we're going. It's so significant as we begin this new year. This morning, I wonder, what are the desires of your heart? What is it deep within you that you're longing for? Is it peace? The peace that passes all understanding? What is it deep inside of you? We all have that thing or those things deep inside of us that are not in alignment with where we would like to be, where we know God's calling us to be. I wonder what it is for you this morning. The prayer team is going to be in the front this morning. And man, I would encourage you just come have someone pray over you. Uh, some of these prayers up here are uh, prophetically gifted and sometimes they have a word in the moment for this person that they're praying for. That may be for you this morning. It's a safe place. I encourage you to come. So let me pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak peace and grace over my friends in this room and all of those online. God, as we begin this new year, we step into it and we trust you. And we uh, want to lean into preparation. We want to lean in and uh, believe for positioning, divine positioning. Probably more important than that, God, we have a desire to actually be aware of when that positioning is happening. When the people in front of us uh, would require us to do the next right thing, help us produce well in those circumstances. We're so grateful. We are so grateful for the, the, for the year behind us and for what we believe you'll do in 2023. Would you guide us, give us great wisdom and insight. May your people be blessed today. In Jesus' name, amen.